my computer because I don't yeah, have Carol's exactly. two factor to uh, to get into. The okay. Computer, so. Yeah, we'll record a computer and then we can upload it later. So, as a note, uh, last year and the year before, we talked a crap ton about deploying WordPress sites with headless using a bunch of different solutions. We're not going to talk about headless. Um, there are a lot of solutions out there that make it super easy. Now we are going to talk about the good old standard. I have a bunch of plugins and I have a theme and I want to deploy that from uh, what I've been working on locally to production. So um, just so you know, we aren't going to do headless tonight. So sans headless, I felt weird. I was like not headless, sans headless because headless, we're going to go headless, headless. Yeah, we're gonna headless. go. We're gonna go coupled instead of decoupled. There you go. There we go. Um, so, the bit I was sitting here thinking about it. I'm like, what do we usually deploy when we go from you know local copies or development copies up to our production? And I really classify it as two changes. We have hard changes and we have soft changes. Hard changes are the physical, okay, the digital files that we copy up and forth, back and forth. Um, they're the things we edit. They're the things we manage in our code editors, and they are the things that are mostly static. Um, you edit a file and it stays static. You edit CSS, plugins are all static files, assets and images. So those are the things we usually deploy as hard changes. Soft changes, I kind of classified as things like our database deltas when we make changes in the database, um, configurations on the server. If we have a bunch of redirects that need to be put into place, we have like plugin configurations, posts and edit and page edits where we're writing the content on the posts and pages and the plugin and theme settings because those are technically all in the database as well. Um, I classified them different because I want to make sure that we very, very clearly understand that anytime we change a plugin setting or a theme setting or edit the content of a post, that is a database change. And I would consider that a soft change, not a hard change. Um, but it's really important to classify these, these two things because it, we should handle them both very differently as we move between environments. So we're going to start with hard changes, files. We manage and deploy file updates with version control. Um, tools like Manage WP are great but they don't actually let us manage change sets. It's just a remote updater. Um, it's great at small scale to use something like Manage WP if you've got like 15 WordPress sites that you're managing. Um, the risk there is though, you're not really actually managing deployment. You're just saying like, oh, that site has a plugin update. I'm gonna do it from here instead of the WordPress admin. So you're not cataloging what changed. You're not testing the version. You're just going live with it and hoping everything goes great. Um, so that's not how we wanna do that usually in, in situations where we need great uptimes and, and, and flawless appointments, uh, deployments. So we wanna actually manage and deploy the files, uh, plugins, themes, assets with version control. I use GitHub, probably most of us use GitHub or GitLab or Git Bitbucket or something similar. Um, you may be old school and use VCS or you might use SVN if you wanna stay on that train, but most of us are on Git these days. So <clears throat> there's really two main ways to really think about managing your files for your sites. You can do individual items, uh, which I've done in the past, where you have a repository on GitHub for your theme and a repository for some custom functionality you have. Um, and then you manage and deploy the theme and you manage to deploy the plugins separately. And uh, that, that works, it's great. It's really isolated and small. Uh, the change sets are much smaller to manage. Um, but the way, and I put an asterisk here because the entire WB content way, because it's not really the entire, but we'll talk about that. Uh, as you put the entire WP content directory into a Git repo. And that entire WP content directory holds your plugins, your themes, and your MU plugins directories, as well as a couple of small, like maybe configuration files, like a maintenance file or something similar. But that way um, you can actually hand off <clears throat> the entire site to someone and say like, just install WordPress and then check out this WP content directory as WP content. And now they're up and running with all of your plugins, all of your themes and everything. So, for me, I really prefer the WP content method. I've done it both ways over the past five years and uh, recently moved to the WP content. I'll call it a mono repo at this point. It's like a monolithic repo instead of just like tiny, small repos. Um, I think it wins every time at this point after having used it for almost six months. <clears throat> it's easier to manage because there's one repository to uh, rule them all. That's my, my one Lord of the Rings joke for the, uh, and I can't even type, it's Lord, not Loader. So, uh, there is, that, that's, it's one repo. I don't have to update one plugin and update another plugin and update the theme. Uh, a lot of times your theme and custom functionality can have a lot of, um, a lot of synergy. Uh, I'll use a buzzword. So it's nice to have those all in one repo so those changes can go at the same time. <clears throat> it's way easier to test. I can make a big change set, hand it off to one of my other developers. And instead of them having to update two or three things, they update one branch and they can test easily. 
Uh, and I think it's really easier to actually build your local and staging copy out of a production site with a single repo. Um, for instance, we uh, will get the database stuff, but I can check out the exact same repo that's on production right now. And I can then roll, uh, use the migrate DB pro to pull in my production database. And now I'm basically running the production version of my site locally, which is super useful uh, when you want to debug stuff. And I think it's much easier to deploy using tools that uh, I'll mention later, like it's way easier to deploy one repo than it is to deploy five or six repos. So this is kind of what the WP content method looks like. This is what I would check out into my WP content directory. I have standard index.php, which is the, you know, silence is golden, nothing loads. My git ignore, which we'll talk about in a little bit. A themes directory containing all my themes for the site. If you're multi-site, I have two or three different themes that I rock on there. One of them for our development blog, one of them for a demo site, and then one of them for our main marketing site. Um, plugins, which literally has every single plugin that we run on the site in there. Um, and then the MU plugins, which we'll talk about in, in a little bit too, which is, you know, if anyone doesn't know, MU stands for must use. You know, we used to have WordPress MU, which is multi-user. Um, MU plugins, people are always confused because it's like, well, it's MU, it's multi-user. It actually is must use plugins. These are plugins that store or site owners cannot deactivate. They run early. They stomp on almost everything that, that gets in the way and you can't deactivate them. So they're great for those situations where you, know, you set up some configurations or um, we'll talk about one of them with the email here in a little bit. But I love MU plugins for custom sites. They're great. So that asterisk at the beginning about the entire WB content directory, we actually do need to worry about that little guy uh, because we do not want to actually put our uploads folder into version control. This is uh, pretty important because as you upload files and images, they get stored into, you know, these certain, you know, the date amended directories, you know, it's 2022, 05, and then your image, 2022, 06. And if you change those or don't have them right spot, when you deploy things, they can be off or you might overwrite something uh, that you had previously in there. So I, I always say, do not mess with your uploads directory. Plugins can put things into the uploads directory. Um, I know that we do uh, some stuff that's like, a, it's a great place for us to store stuff because we know it's writable and we know it exists. So we'll do things like put an error log in the uploads directory. Um, it's where we upload for EDD. It's where we upload all the product files for a user. We store them in a directory inside the uploads folder because when you upload your file to deliver, it has to go somewhere we know uploads exists. And um, this also keeps your uh, deltas smaller. So if you were to go through and change all of your images or you run a, a smush it or an image optimizer, uh, it changes the bit. Whenever we do deployments, it's actually checking um, the files bit by bit. It doesn't matter if the file name changes, it actually is the, is the content of the file different. And if we edit an image locally and we push it up to production, it's actually gonna overwrite what was previously there. But if we have a lot of images that we're overwriting, that deployment can take a very long time because most of our sites have a lot of images. Hey, Jeremy. Uh, so here's some tips that I've learned in the past six months on doing mono repo deployments. Use git ignore, that file that I had in there, the git ignore. You wanna make sure you don't put the uploads directory in there so you can tell git ignore to, and we'll, oh, I think I have an example next, I do, good. So the git ignore, we ignore our uploads directory. So that is never committed into git, which also means it's never deployed when we use our uh, deployment process. Another big one is if you're running anything with node modules or you're running any automation scripts with Webpack or Grunt, you definitely wanna add your node modules, all node modules folders, no matter what, to your, uh, to your gitignore because if there's one way to slow down a deployment, it's to have node modules. You can go from having a slim one megabyte plugin to six to 10 megabytes worth of files if you deploy your node modules. So make sure that you add node modules at any level recursively to the get ignore. Uh, it's really cool because we can run plugin updates locally. <clears throat> I can actually uh, uh, check out my site locally, get on a branch, hit update on all the plugins. And now, you know, we usually look at change logs and go, all right, well, what changed? I can look at the change logs. But when I do it in a mono repo, I check out all the changes, hit update on WordPress. And then I can actually go to get diff and submit a pull request. And I have what every plugin has changed, which gives me the opportunity as a store owner who highly customizes sites. And that's what we usually do for clients is highly customize things. If we're using a feature or something, we can actually go through and see what every single one of our plugins changed. 
it's not just a change log, it's literally the files that change. So we can actually identify much easier if they change something that we're expecting to work. Um, it saves downtime because we never enter maintenance mode. Um, we just deploy out and the way that the server overwrites files, um, there's never the maintenance mode because we never have uh, a missing plugin. Uh, I don't know if many people know this, uh, but being painfully aware of how the WordPress plugin updater works, it puts your site in maintenance mode, which means you see that you know, uh, under maintenance message that is very unstyled and we should improve. Um, <clears throat> it then downloads the package from WordPress.org or wherever your update's coming from. It deletes the old folder, old folder and then moves the new folder in place. So the reason maintenance mode exists is because if someone visited your site, well, it was in the middle of deleting a folder and re-adding a folder, they could see fatal errors because files that are expecting to be there are missing. A delete is really quick, don't get me wrong, it's fast. But there is a moment where that file copy could put you in a situation where you have a missing plugin. So by doing it in a monorepo in our deployment process, we can actually write these files much quicker and not have that downtime. Uh, it also lets you test everything locally first to make sure that you know everything is expected for an e-commerce site. Your checkout still works after updating all your plugins, kind of a big one. I think a lot of people forget that on, on mission critical business sites is they'll hit update and I walk away and be like, all right, I did my job for the day. I have to deal my plugin. I'm going to go have dinner. But that doesn't mean that it works. <laughs> you might have a problem with checkout. There might have been a JavaScript error. Your cache may not have cleared. Um, we can actually test all of this locally and in staging because we're just deploying through the environments uh, before ever going live so we know what to expect. Uh, and we can, we can again, stop uh, mission critical things from breaking. Um, one thing, the F, uh, this is something I learned with like SFTP. Let's say that I, I update a plugin locally. I update, I think up, uh, today I updated ACF. I think it was. And I was working on getting that, an update for ACF deployed. Um, well, ACF added a couple new files and deleted some, some legacy files, or they just moved files around. Well, if you SFTP, your director would be like, all right, I updated ACF. I'm just going to upload ACF to the server now. I tested it. It's good to go. It doesn't delete old files. It will put the new ones on there, but the old files will still exist because SFTP is a one direction method. Whereas when we use our deployment methods with Git and checkouts, it will actually look at the disk and be like, well, this file's gone. This file's in. So it will swap out files for you. Um, we can use pull requests when we use monorepos. It's great if I'm making JavaScript changes or changes to the checkout or changes to product pages, or let's say you have an awesome like submission form uh, that you styled, you can submit the changes, get a pull request built and have someone else review it, look through the changes, make sure you're not missing anything, but then they can also check it out and they can actually review it and make sure it's working as expected, not just on your machine. It's always good to have two machines, make sure something works. And it ensures that we don't have any errant testing code, bar dump, exits, anything like that. Since we're doing a pull request, we can see every change. We can go through and look and see if we left in some of our debugging code before it goes to production. A tip is to keep it a private repo. You do not want this. If this is your marketing site, if you're a business, you do not want your website repo being public. Um, a lot of this just has to do with you're making decisions for your business or your client. And keeping that stuff to yourself is probably pretty good because a lot of times you'll have conversations or comments or you'll kind of uh, maybe de do some configuration stuff that you think a, a is secret sauce or B might contain like public API keys or something, which shouldn't be in your code, but they might be. Um, that way it's secret and it's yours. Uh, anyone using less SaaS, uh, Webpack, anything like that? Um, this is your friend because you can actually in your CI continuous integration from the continuous deployment, when you push to staging, have it build all your JavaScript assets at the server level, not locally. You know, Dave was just trying to build web, uh, was a Gutenberg on his machine uh, and it took a couple minutes. Well, <clears throat> you could have that all done, push it up to the server. Now the server is running all that for you and then it will deploy it to your staging or deploy it to production compiled. So you don't have to do all that locally. Um, it really makes it easy to do the three environment process, which is something I stand by and live by. I even have four environments now. I have a beta for very, very large change sets, um, but work local, work staging, work production. And you always deploy in that process. Work local, deploy staging, test, deploy production, test. My new process is deploy lo or work local. If it's a small change set, go to staging, go to production. If it's a huge change set, that's gonna take me months to finish, I'll go to beta. And then that way, eventually, I can get the staging. 
Uh, and the database, we'll get to this, um, but you need to keep your local and your staging somewhat updated for your production so that you're working with data that you would expect to see in production. And I, I typically use Migrate DB Pro for that. Or sorry, DB Pro. Is that the new announcement? It's called no, DB so it's Pro just now? WP Migrate. WP Migrate. I can never get it right. It's so, WP Migrate now. So I guess one, one quick question here. I assume that you are not using new full site editing themes in your model. We are not. We are not. No, okay. these are very, these are our custom sites. These are not, these aren't like, um, full site editing themes, no. Okay. I guess the one tiny caveat I would throw in here, if you're dealing with a full site editing site where it's saving global styles in the post table, where it's saved anytime you edit a template and you, and changing a menu is editing a template, uh, that's pulling the HTML file out of the theme, putting that in the database too. So, um, it used to be really easy to keep like files isolated. And if you're dealing with full site editing, you almost always need a database deploy and sync whenever you're doing, if, if you've changed it. Now, if you have like all your changes like in your theme and you aren't using the site editor, no worries, but. That's, that's like one of the, I feel like that's the untold thing that no one's talking about with full site editing, I feel like. I mean, some people are, there are communities talking about it. But I feel like full site editing is is not like ready for the corporate deployment process because it is so heavily reliant on the database, which is like the it's it's the the crutch. It's a thing that that stops so many production environments with WordPress is the database. I agree, but uh, Pagely.com is full site editing, so it's there yeah, are folks have... that are figuring it out. But so they handle that, but again, I mean, pagely.com is full site editing. That's great. That's pagely.com who's paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to their engineering staff every year to figure out how to deploy that stuff. Sure. So I, I think that's where we lose it. It's, it. it's easy to do at the top tier engineer level. We can figure it out, but it's harder to do at the, I just made this site for uh, a, a small, from a small agency to a small client to say like, well, how do I handle the deployment? So. Uh, that's a good caveat, though, is full site editing will have some challenges with this. Uh, and utilizing MU plugins, uh, I, I said it before, I'll say it again, MU plugins are great because you can't disable them, and we can really tuck some really fun stuff into uh, MU plugins. That git ignore I was talking about. So in mine, uh, I am a multi-site, so I have blogs that I don't, that holds a lot of images for all the subsites. That one I don't put in there. Um, the upgrade directory, um, running WP Rockets, so I don't I don't commit my WP Rocket config. I don't commit my uploads. And this is a big one. If you're using any object cache or advanced caching plugins, we don't want those configurations committed to the GitHub repository because those change between environments. Um, node modules, like I said, definitely make sure that's gone because if you commit your node modules, you will just not have a good day. It is just, your repo will be huge. Your commits will take forever and your polls will take forever. So how do you all deploy file changes currently? Anyone got a method that they're using? Oh, you're on mute, John. Of course. Um, yeah, I've been using I've, I've been using a very similar system to this and then connect it to BuddyWorks. And then I'll typically have like a, and that's buddy.works for anybody who's not familiar, but I'll typically have a main and a, staging and sometimes even a dev branch. And then I set it up so that anything I push to the dev branch automatically uploads to the dev server and you know on down the line. And it's just been, it's been great to use this. I actually learned it from a client um, that I started working with. They have, they had an in-house tech team that was using it and I was just taking over one of their properties. So it's been so smooth to um, do this. And yeah, generally I use the same format. I have had one or two sites. And again, that's just because I inherited them this way where the Git root is actually in the root of WordPress. <laughs> so your Git ignore file gets quite a bit uh, bigger in that instance, but it, it still works. I definitely prefer the WP content method that you're talking about. So but yeah, so using something like BuddyWorks is really nice because it's just, I save my changes. I do want to learn about this. Uh, I've never compiled on the server before. And 
uh, I, I'm running on one of my client sites is an old foundation site and it hasn't been updated at all. And um, I, up, I updated to a M1 MacBook Pro in the fall and the compiler for the SAS on that site does not work with my MacBook Pro and I have not been able to figure out a workaround. So I actually have a very old Mac Mini sitting on my desk. <laughs> and anytime I need to compile SAS, I push my changes. I turn on screen sharing, I compile, and it's crazy how much slower compiling is on a 2012 Mac Mini. <laughs> um, but then I have to compile on there and then push the changes. So yeah, I, I think I need to learn about this compiling on the server. <laughs> John, is it because of your Node version? Uh, you know, I, I'm sure it is. Like I've, it is, I've out tried out. updating packages and bypassing and all that, and I just have check not out. found the right. So yeah, search up Node version manager yeah. NBM. Yeah, and then yeah. you can put an NBM RC in your root, and then type NBM use in your file root, and it'll use a different version of Node. Um, so if you can determine what the oldest version of Node supports your compiler, that'll fix that problem for you. Mm, You'll just okay. have to yeah. Node on your computer, which is all well. So that, that usually is a good workaround. In this particular case, um, the OG like SAS library just does not work on M1, like period, no yes. matter the Node version. Yeah, it's real fun. But there, there's, there's, everywhere. Two, there's two good workarounds. There are two good workarounds. Uh, one is that you can use uh, the Dart SAS, uh, which is true SAS, um, but uh, is a different compiler for SAS. Um, another thing is, is that you can use uh, post CSS um, and give it the SAS um, standards. There's, you can get a post CSS plugin that just will compile SAS down the same way that SAS would, and it supports variables, mix-ins, all the fun things that SAS does. Um, so that's an alternative. But yeah, uh, if you're if you're looking for a great place to do it, um, like we use GitHub Actions to do all our um, uh, compilation. Um, so no matter whether you know we use multiple Node versions, we do this, we do that, um, and you can force it to use Mac, you can force it to use Windows. Linux is, I think, the cheapest, um, mm -hmm. and and that's sort of how how we roll with that. But you basically just say install this version of Node, install this version of PHP, um, you know. Uh, run composer install, run, you know, my npm install, and then execute my commands, and it goes and does everything. So, and, and Buddy can compile too. Uh, I am, I, I just started using Buddy. That's what, what I'm using. Um, I am not a pro at it. I didn't set ours up, but I know that some, some of the people I work with use Buddy to compile as well. Um, yeah. I'm not sure exactly how they do it, but Buddy Works is really cool, and it's a really nice service. But yeah, I would it is. I mean, it I was aware it could do more because I, you know, every time I set one up, I just do, do this S SFTP action and there's all these other things on there. And I wonder what, what do all those things do? <laughs> I would second Jeremy with MVM. MVM is great. Like, especially if you add an MVM RC to a project, like then it will like handle the switching for you. So if one project needs 14 and one needs 17 and one needs 12, like you can have all of those versions. And as long as you're in the right directory, MVM will pick the right NPM yeah. and, and node to use with that, like with that NVM RC file. So it's a great way if you're working across like years worth of projects, um, yes. like Gatsby always needs more advanced NPM and node than a lot of the WordPress stuff does, so. And I'm glad that you were there with the fact about the, the yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> I, I only know it because I just got an M1 Mac and I did a ton of reading, like what is going to not work? So. Yeah. Uh, George, I see. Yeah, I didn't do that reading beforehand. <laughs> George, you're using FTP and Git. Um, so this can still work for you. Uh, I previously used a service called Deploy HQ. Um, to do very, very much this, what I would do is I would hook up deploy HQ to my, to my Git directory. So it's managing everything in Git and deploy HQ would actually look at the, you know, whenever it triggers a change, it would actually look at the previous uh, commit and then in the commit, the latest commit, figure out the file differences, and then it would push the files via SFTP. So if there was a removal, it would remove, if it would, if it is an update, it would update, if it was add, it would just deploy the changes. 
Um, and it does so via SFTP. So you don't have to install Git or anything on the server. You just give it your SFTP credentials and say, hey, whenever there's a commit to this repository, deploy it over to my server using SFTP, uh, SSH, SFTP, same, same protocol. Um, but again, it figures out the diff for you. So if you only edit one file, it's only gonna modify that one file in the commit. It's not gonna replace everything, uh, which makes it a really quick process because it does do the deltas of the file changes. So that's, that's a good option too, is deployhq.com. And you can make it automatic or you can make it manual. We had things like, oh, if it's the staging branch or if it's the dev branch, it deploys to this server, which is staging. If it's the master uh, branch, it goes to production, which is this server, these directories. Uh, this is the repo to look at, watch for. You can make it say, hey, whenever you see a push, whenever there's a commit, go ahead and deploy automatically without my intervention. Or you could even just say only deploy when I go in and hit deploy, um, which are good options too whatever you feel most comfortable with. Some people aren't really comfortable with the full automation. Some people like to have a little control and hit go. And it's so fast. It's amazing it how fast it gets up there. Yep, it's really awesome. It's so cool. Sweet, anyone else using some interesting or awesome or really useful ways to deploy your files and changes? I would say we're basically doing what you're doing, Chris. The one difference is that we use uh, rsync. So we do mm -hmm. like a mono repo. We put a WP content folder up there and then we do any builds that we need to do. Um, and then we basically have given um, our GitHub uh, repo an SSH key for our server. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have it do an rsync to this IP with this key. Um, we use a dist ignore file to ignore certain like, you know, uh, things that we don't want coming out of the Git and uh, good old rsync. It's pretty quick. Yeah, our our buddy uses rsync as well. rsync is great. It's way better than copy SCP, which is, is fine and it works. rsync is so much faster and saves so much bandwidth um, than than uh, using uh, SCP. Yeah. Cool. John, John, real quick, I did drop in a install command for how you can get an M1 Mac to try to install Intel packages and run them all through Rosetta. So wait, Thank are you. they still, do? okay, I might be dating myself with Max here, but like, wasn't Rosetta the thing we did when we were trying to go from PowerPC to Intel? Yes, this is Rosetta yeah. too. It's going back from <laughs> okay. Intel to an ARM. <laughs> yeah. So just spell Rosetta backwards and it's, it's, it's F set or. Yeah, but basically uh, the Mac will handle everything in the background if you just say that the target architecture is x64. That's so. awesome. Very cool. Yeah, I tried about four different things and had no luck and then finally realized I've got this Mac mini that just sits on my desk that <laughs> so that was my quick and quickest and easiest fix. Hey, whatever gets the job done, man. Sometimes I was really stuck. I was stunned though, because I got an M1, you know, a year after they'd been out. And I just thought, how is this an unsolved problem still? And I found some of these workarounds, but a lot of them just flew over my head. So once you dive into system architecture and compilers, like is it, is it, it's all out there, man. That's that's yeah, so yeah. deep level stuff. Cool. Uh, well, let's uh, move forward. We're gonna go with some soft changes. I've got a few categories I'll talk about in soft changes. Hard changes, it's all pretty much the same. Whether it's a CSS file or a JavaScript file or PHP file, you're just moving bits and that's fine. But soft changes, I, I kind of broke down into a few. And then the first one I'll start with is configs. Um, some configuration tips to avoid unexpected behavior is kind of what I was going for here. Um, I use environment variables. I don't know if anyone has used this method, but like in my WP config, I actually have things like define my site env, and I say, you know, and I put this in my WP config because this is not in the repo. This lives local only or in staging only or production only. And I have to go into my WP config and actually put this in there. This means later in my code, I can actually check, am I in production? Am I in staging? Am I in uh, local? Um, sometimes I'll just use like my site is prod because I don't care if local and staging kind of act the same. I only want production to act different. Um, you can use the old school define method, define variable um, value, or you can just use the new constant uh, format, which I actually really prefer because um, it's really telling me that it's a constant, not like a standard define. Um, those are super cool. I use them heavily and I put them in my wconfig in every single uh, 
Yes, and WP environment type is something lots of plugins are starting to respect. Um, I typically use these when I'm writing very custom stuff. Uh, and the, the biggest one I use it for is not sending email unless I'm in production. Um, there are plugins like don't send emails or things like that. The problem is as I move between environments, it's very possible for that plugin to get turned off or on very easily. If I hand the repo to a new person and they kick up their WordPress site and they import the database uh, from production, then the plugin will be disabled and it's possible that they'll send emails until they realize they have to enable the do not send emails plugin. So I use this, this is in a, a PHP file that sits in my MU plugins. And it basically says, look, if it's not production, then we're just gonna overload WP mail and make it do nothing. So I never send emails in my local sites. Um, when I need to test things, I will sometimes move into production and very specifically test certain aspects of it. Um, but overall, I will not allow my locals or my stagings to send any emails. And this is like the foolproof way to make that happen because MU plugins is gonna load before anything else that overrides WP mail, which means my MU plugin is saying, this is what WP mail is and it's just a simple return statement. Um, this will stop things like, oh, my customer got a renewal email that says that they need to renew their license key and the link to renew it is local.dev. Um, that's, that's very, it doesn't put a lot of trust in your customers. It doesn't put a lot of trust in the clients you're building sites for when emails get sent out to their, their customers uh, from your local dev environment. So this is like one of my critical things I put on all my sites that is I'm moving between environments. Um, <clears throat> so why do I like environment constants? Uh, well, I can condition low Google Analytics. I can first sort first force certain con site configurations. So for instance, on my local EDB site, um, I always, no matter what, set the to test mode. So I never accidentally try and submit actual payment data. Um, that is one of them use. I set some specific things about like search ind indexing. It means uh, even if I leave my staging site open to the public, uh, which I, I don't, but some places do, if they don't put maintenance mode in there, that Google won't pick it up and start cataloging your, your staging site. Um, I know you can check the box inside WordPress that says don't track this or don't index this, but like this way, no matter what that setting is, it will always not index it. Um, and I had to put a disclaimer that this environment constants are not expressly endorsed by CBS, Peacock TV, Steve Carell, Michael Scott, Michael Scarn, Thunder Mifflin, Thunder Mifflin Saber, Michael Scott Paper Company, or Serenity by Jim. I don't know, any Office fans? I just went through the whole series before this. This is why my detox is good. Uh, but yeah, I love environment variables. They're great, they're super useful. Um, and again, we're just trying to prevent the unexpected. And if we can do that with a single line in our WP config and one constant check later in our code, um, it's so much easier. Who writes redirects all the time? I write a ton of redirects. Redirects are a necessary evil in today's content marketing world uh, and just site maintenance in general. Um, Servers are super efficient at redirects. I have always and long stood been the person who says, do not use PHP to put your redirects. Do not use a plugin for redirects. I was wrong. Um, this knowledge came from about five years ago and now we've gotten to a point where it's actually okay to do this, I believe. Um, redirects were hard to manage. Only like one or two people in the company usually had the access to put the redirect on the server which means that having your support technician deploy a redirect or having your marketing person put a redirect in was like, okay, well, give me the redirect and I'll put it on the server and then they're stuck waiting for you. Plugins are much easier for this. We can't really deploy these very easily, but most of them do have import exports. So we can uh, import a set of redirects much easier. So when it's time to deploy, we just upload a XML or a CSV file and it, it submits all the redirects for us. Um, and most redirect plugins, uh, all-in-one SEO's redirect, uh, redirect uh, plugin, um, redirection, and I believe Pretty Links Lite all support redirects now, but they do it via the, um, so early on that they're actually not even loading all of the WordPress theme and stuff. They're usually doing it via the REST API at this point. So they're, they're much more efficient than they used to be about five or six years ago, which is why I'm okay with them now. And it means I don't have to be the one to play redirects. I can have someone else on my team do it for me, which, uh, you know, is just a time saver. I can delegate. Um, but it's important to catalog and note all of them. Um, if you're moving between environments, if you're deploying a brand new site, you have to redirect a bunch of stuff, do it all local, get it all working local, export all the redirects, and then import all the redirects instead of having to manually type them. 
Uh, who is an ACF person? I am now. I didn't used to be. I am now. Uh, I have fallen in love with ACF. Um, I used to be like, who needs ACF? And then I started managing my own marketing site and I'm like, everybody needs ACF. Um, ACF is super cool and handy for these soft changes that you wanna move between environments. And I think it's because it's built by developers for developers, it makes a lot of sense. So um, for instance, if you go to our homepage, easydigitaldownloads.com, you'll see this cool 411 reviews with a 4.7 star rating. I'm super proud of that. It's awesome. It's going up every day. Those are ACF fields for me. Um, I no longer have to deploy a change to change one of those. Like I just have a task on my list to update that every two weeks. Go look at our star rating, go look at how many reviews we have and update that in ACF. The coolest part is that you can create all these fields locally, get it working in your theme or your plugin. You can export the fields into a, a file and then import that file into production when you go live and all your fields are there and ready for you. They're exactly as they were in, in your local. You never have to worry about like, well, did the files copy? You can even do this. I believe they have, uh, a, a, you can get a, a static file that you upload. You can actually even get PHP to register these too. They'll give you two options. You can export a PHP snippet that you can put into your theme and it will actually just auto make them. So great for doing page content. However, I will stress this, please, before you do an ACF, always make sure that you do function exist get field. Um, I had a site fail error one time because I assumed ACF was active for some reason and it wasn't. Um, what's nice about this is I can just put a default value in. Like if the uh, average rate review is 407, uh, it should be 4.7, but ACF is there. So you look at this and you're like, all right, fine. Uh, if, if ACF is for some reason disabled or is in the middle of an update, just return a value. Otherwise, let's go ahead and get the value and give it a default. So if it, if it finds it, great. If not, it just uses 4.7. Um, yeah. What it's Excuse worth, I, I don't know if you, you didn't really touch on this, but yeah. I actually am able to, or there's a, a single line filter where you can actually fully disable the ACF GUI on production. So one filter disables the full ACF GUI. So all of your fields are loading from the JSON configuration files. Oh, cool. And there's no GUI. If you want, I can send it to you. It's been a while since I touched it, but I can send it to you. Yeah, that'd be cool. I mean, I, I use the fields in admin to fill out this data, but that's really awesome. I like no, that. no, no, not, oh, not to the, register them. the register fields, like the edit oh. the fields part, completely in, untouchable. You might, knowing you, you might have changed admin permissions to make it extra hard for people to do that. Well, why don't you just take out the GUI altogether? That's awesome. That's actually a great idea. Yeah, I like that. Uh, while you talk about it, I'll look it up for you. Yeah, that's up. awesome. Chris, you didn't mention ACF JSON. Do you know about that? Where you just if you make an what, ACF JSON folder in your theme? I didn't. No, I'm I'm new to ACF, so this is okay. So if you just make in your theme a folder called ACF-JSON, then every time you save a, a custom field group, it updates a JSON file. And then when you, you know, which that's in your repo then. So then the next time you push your theme to your server, it auto, it'll automatically see that JSON update that mm -hmm. and it'll let you sync the changes back. So it, is, it, it effectively turns all your custom fields into uh, trackable, fields it's, it's yeah, amazing it's fantastic awesome i'm gonna to have to do that and then i'm gonna do what jeremy said and i'm just gonna disable the whole interface in production to not show that stuff yeah i like it that's awesome thanks for the heads up so yeah that's a like i said i usually do export and then import this would replace that because i would define all my custom fields in a json file or oh, sorry i create them locally and it would write those to a json file and then i commit that json file and when i go to production it will just handle all the it's new there. fields for me that's yeah cool. they're there that's my new thing. And it's a little, tomorrow. it's a little confusing to me because if you like, if you have a, if you have a custom field for a post, um, and you push it up, I, I need to look into this, or maybe somebody knows the answer. But if you if you you know push it up that ACF JSON, and then you go edit a post on the server, it sees your ACF JSON changes, like whatever you might have changed about that. But you can still go into the custom fields section and see, oh, this field group got updated and it's waiting to be synced. So it's like the changes show up even though you haven't fully synced them back into ACF. Oh, and I'm not sure what's going on with that. Yeah. Magic. Magic's going on. 
That's awesome. That's that's a good tip. Uh, I'm going to have to look into ACF chat, Jason. That could be super handy for tracking field changes uh, to, between deployments. Talking about trackable things, that's that's a huge one. Oh, yeah. Very cool. So Thank I you. I uploaded the URL to just what he's talking about. Yep, this is my new thing. I'm going to work on that tomorrow. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so I've, everyone's even, I've even like duplicated some you know, stuff just by dealing with the JSON directly rather than making the... Yeah, because you know you can get it. You just have to make sure that you go down to the very last line of the ACF JSON and update the, just manually update the time it was changed, so it recognizes oh some changes have happened in this that I have to implement. So that's cool. I like that a lot. That seems great. And like, again, that goes back to a traceable. That's why we do things in Git. Like yeah. we do things in Git so we can trace things. I, I don't think I talked about one of my favorite features of of doing using a mono repo for everything is that. Um, especially in a production site, if it's e-commerce, if it's critical to a business, you push changes live and in the middle of the night, someone wakes up and says, okay, well, uh, those changes we did broke something. No one can check out or no one can submit the, the lead magnet. No one can submit their, their, their request for a quote. Um, and if your business weren't an e-commerce or lead magnets or lead generation, that's money out the drain. <clears throat> uh, the beauty of is if you're in version control, you can just be like, all right, revert the changes, commit back to master, deploy it. And guess what? We may not have the new fancy stuff we did yesterday, but we're at least functional again, um, which is super important. So cool. I'm going to definitely note. I noted that I, uh, I'm a planner over here to look at that tomorrow. Now, this is the one everyone wants to talk about. Soft changes of the database, and it's super tricky. The reality is, this is why it's hard. Plugins store lots of stuff in custom post types and post meta, which means every little change we do to things, and like Dave was saying with full site editing, it's all stored in the database. So every tiny little thing we do is in the database. And there's really not a good way to just sync the changes we want from one dev to database environment to the other. Because while we're working over in staging or local, there's stuff happening in production especially if there's transactional data, e-commerce data, lead magnets, form submissions, things like that. Those are all stored in the database. Um, some of them have their own custom tables, some of them don't. Um, comments are being generated. Um, posts are being updated by the marketing team. All of these things are happening in production, which is now distancing us from what we're at in staging and local. Because we're not writing the same content they're writing. We're not doing all the marketing efforts, which means we can't just push the production over at the database because we will get rid of all that work that they've done. So every action you take basically in WordPress, whether it's settings or configurations, it's all going to hit the database at some point. And everyone always asks, like, well, let's just deploy the changes. That's called a DB delta. The DB delta is looking at the difference between one uh, database and where we got from point A to point B. The problem is we're not looking from point A to point B. We're actually looking from point A to point B and point A to point B or C and D. So we're really kind of looking at, okay, we changed here and they changed here. Which one of these is right and which is wrong? Um, some very, very brilliant minds in the WordPress space have tried to figure this out. Uh, and their entire projects have just not gone anywhere. I think actually we were just talking about uh, migrate, shoot, what is it now? WP migrate. migrate. WP yeah. migrate. It's the best way to do it. Yeah. Um, well, they tried to come up with a service. I think it was called Mergebot. Um, about three or four years ago, they came up with this idea that they were gonna handle this. They were gonna problem solve this. And I don't know if you guys know anything about um, Delicious Brains and what they've done over there with, um, with their migrate stuff, but they are one of the de facto standards for migrating databases around in WordPress. They have figured out a lot of problems, but they shut down Mergebot because the problem was just too much. There was too many things happening that they couldn't consistently do it 100% accurate. And when you're dealing with businesses paying you for a service, it has to be accurate. So if you ever figure out how to do DB deltas between WordPress environments and make it work flawlessly, you have a million dollar idea sitting on your, on your plate right there because um, hosting companies have tried to figure this out for the managed WordPress environments. It's not easy. We, we can get close, but close just isn't always great. I think the only people that really do it in production are Liquid Web. Um, they do it for WooCommerce products. Um, mm -hmm. So they will be a, do a DB Delta change and pull your production products and sales over to staging so that you can mm -hmm. like test with like fresh data and vice versa. Um, 
but yeah, I, I don't but, envy. But the most of them don't go the other way very easily, where you're going from staging to production. That's that's where it gets really dicey. Yeah. Um, especially with e-commerce. Let me tell you, with e-commerce, it's a mess. Um, you know, you could if you overwrite purchase data, all of a sudden people who paid you money don't have access to their to their purchase history anymore, which is a bad thing. People don't like that. So um, like I said, this is hard. Um, it's not it's not un it's not impossible. Um, so kind of, I put some do's and don'ts because this is what I've learned over the years. Do write everything down that you need to do for the deployment if there's database changes, like change this setting, go to here, change this setting, go to here, change that setting, go to here, update this content, change this post, change this meta. Just write it down if you have a process. Um, try and keep the changes you're doing at a code level. Um, I have done things where I've written like upgrade routines into my code where it's, I just keep like an option of a version of my custom plugin in the database. And I'll, when the plugin hits in it, <clears throat> it'll just say, hey, what's the current version? And if the version is lower um, than what the current version is deployed. So if I have a version of the database like 1.0 and I deploy version 1.1 of my plugin, um, I do a check and say like, okay, the, the version of the database is 1.0, the version I'm running is 1.1. I need to run my upgrade routine. My upgrade routine will go through and it will change things like set options up correctly. So I don't have to manually go in and do it. I've done that before. It's not ideal, but it works. <clears throat> um, have it all had prepared ahead of time. So when it's time to deploy that you aren't scrambling to figure out what changes you made. Um, just be very, very clear and, and explicit on what changes need to happen between production and staging, um, and, or sorry, uh, staging and production before you do it. Um, if you ran into a hiccup at any point, don't be like, well, that was a fluke. No, you write that down and you figure out why it was a fluke. Um, don't assume that just because your environments are different that they won't act the same way when you get when you go live with it. Um, yes, it's staging. Yes, it's production. Yes, they're on different servers. But if there's ever a fluke with uh, changing a setting or something goes wrong on your staging deployment, just stop, figure out what went wrong, note it down, and figure out if you can solve it in code or if, you, if it's part of your process. Um, Always, always, always have a staging environment ready when you're doing database changes. Um, staging environments don't affect bottom line revenue. They don't affect leads. They don't affect um, any of that stuff. So you can rebuild staging really easy. It's a little more difficult to rebuild production because you're taking downtime. So test everything in staging, do everything, run a purchase, submit a form, request a quote, um, do all of it. Uh, make it part of your process to basically go through and test everything to make sure that Staging is working as you expect before you go live. Uh, and then find ways to update some aspects before uh, going live, like ACF, for instance. Uh, this, this JSON thing is gonna be great for me because I've always had the step of, all right, did I make any changes to my ACF fields? Yes, I have to upload the JSON file. Um, I don't have to do that now, so thanks for everyone here. Um, but there's always aspects you can do before you go live. Make sure your code is, is coded defensively so that if the value you're expecting to be inserted into an ACF field or something doesn't exist, that you are accounting for it with a fallback value, um, things like that. Don't ever deploy and leave, um, check it all. Just lesson learned there, I've done that before. Um, try and import a staging database to live. Um, don't do that, just don't. Um, it's never gonna end well and it's pretty irreversible. So uh, the only way you could really do it is to pull your backup and restore that. The problem there is when's your last backup? I'm pretty sure we're not all taking you know, hourly backups, but if you do it the right way, do before you hit deploy, make a backup, then deploy. And that way, if you ruin production, you can just put the database back in there. Uh, pick out the changes yourself. It isn't worth your time. If the database gets updated and you're like, okay, well, I made this change to this table, this change to this table, I'm just gonna run a SQL statement to go ahead and update all these. Don't, um, I've seen that by many people in, in the rear before because they're messing with serialized data sometimes. Um, anytime you run into serialized data, you can really mess that up pretty bad. And don't panic. If something goes wrong, um, if you followed all the proper change processes, which is you know having steps ready, you have a fallback plan. What's the, it's the quote is, um, if you don't plan to fail, or if you, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Anytime you're doing an appointment, have processes and procedures written down so and, and just systemize them, make them the thing. This is what we do when this happens. This is how we move forward. This is how we roll back and make them a standard document so that every time you do it, you're just consistently doing the same thing. 
uh, automation, we talked a little bit earlier, uh, buddy, we've got deploy HQ, GitHub actions. So these are just some really, really quick ways. The reason I love automation is it's repeatable. Uh, once we get the automation working correctly, uh, we can deploy whenever we want. Um, someone wants to site change really quick, no problem. I'll just commit the code up and it will automatically deploy. It's consistent. Um, it does the same thing over and over. No forgetting to copy and paste a command in place. No forgetting to copy one of the files over. Um, there's no human errors of fat fingering a file name or accidentally deleting a file from production. Um, there's less remembering on our part as developers. We've got a lot in our brains. One of the things we don't always do is remember things well. Um, so it's less remembering of what we do every time. Um, did I say repeatable and did I say consistent? Because those are the two things that deployments have to be, repeatable and consistent. Um, less file uh, downtime for file copies, like I was telling George with deploy HQ. Um, it does a diff and only copy up, copies up the file it needs instead of deleting a whole directory and then replacing it. And it'll actually abandon, uh, remove abandoned files. And this one is something that I think a lot of people forget about with the SFTP method. If a plugin removes a file and you don't remove it, if you just hit like a SFTP copy up, it's not going to remove the file that the plugin has removed. It will still sit there. It will be abandoned. It will be orphaned. And it will just sit there forever until you go through and remove those files or remove the entire plugin. Because uh, someone could find that file. They know it exists. If there's an exploit in it, it's never getting the update to, from now on out. So whatever it was at, at the last time that the file existed in the plugin, that's its state forever. So a plugin that was updated in 2005 that's on your site, if they change the file name and you're using SFTP to do updates, that file is still there. So uh, remove abandoned files is a key one with automation. Some of the ones I've used, BuildKite, which is just a task runner, um, Buddy, uh, which John is using and I'm using now, GitHub Actions, which Dave is using. I've used DeployHQ in the past or Circle CI. Any build tool that's listed as a CI CD that's continuous integration, which is to run unit tests and things like that, uh, um, or uh, front end testing, and CD. The CD is actually continuous deployment, meaning that it should automate the process of pushing files from one place to another. Um, and that's really what's needed um, in this case. So your goal should be that when changes are made to the repository, the tool copies only what's needed in place. Every single one of them, the ones I have listed over here on the left is, is it will do that for you. So how do y'all automate stuff? John's got Buddy. Dave's got GitHub Actions. Jeremy, what are you automating with? FileZilla. Sorry, I'm trying to learn my my hot piece for Zoom. Um, oh, I wish I could say that I had more automations. I I I have room for improvements. So that's the truth. All right, that's good. That's what we're here for. Mike Eagle, you guys automating anything? No. I've been using a plugin called WP Synchro to keep uh, my uh, production and staging or production and development and de databases. So uh, I usually uh, run that before I do any of my development work so that my uh, development site is in sync with my production site before I start. Now, is this a SaaS or is it uh, all plugin based? It's plugin based. Okay, cool. So you you set up APIs on uh, both side. Well, either way, whichever way you want to go, and then you set up a uh, a push or a pull, and you can set it up for files or just you set it for files or database or both. And uh, very cool. It seems to work pretty good. I like the GitHub thing, though. That's pretty interesting. Before we moved, uh, when we were on Pagely, we used GitHub Actions to deploy our site. Um, uh, it's Synchro here. I'll link it in. There you go, George. Um, Synchro is pretty cool. Uh, I've seen it once, I think, on a site that I was working on for a friend. It worked pretty well. I, I like the fact that you could do just files, uh, which is really nice. Uh, and I think that's what um, 
did he migrate just did too they just released just files i think right yeah um so it's cool to see multiples now giving that option because sometimes i just want the files to sync i don't need the database or whatever i think I one of the other really powerful things in wp migrate is if you have a multi-site and you're trying to copy a site within a multi-site or if you're trying to pull a site out of a multi-site and turn it into a single site or vice versa, WP Migrate is like the best thing to do that. Like you can do it by hand, but it's worth its weight in gold if you ever have to do that. Yeah, I need to, I have a EDDs running on a multi-site for our demos and everything. And I'm, I'm about ready to pull those all out and, and start making single sites because I hate managing a multi-site. Interesting. I've used and, uh, I've used Duplicate Pro for that too. It's a little, uh, you can back up your multi-site, and then when you uh, restore, you can restore just a single site. Is that Duplicator? Duplicator Pro? Duplicator Pro, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, oh, I think he used to come to the meetups. Uh, I don't know if he's still in the Phoenix area. That's Bob Riley's. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty good plug, right? Yeah. Yeah, Snap Creek. That's, that's uh, Bob Riley's company. Yep. He's, uh, he used to attend our meetups. Uh, I haven't seen him in quite a while. Yeah, like, it, it's in the pro version. It's not yeah. in the uh, free version. Not in the free one? Okay. So, there, yeah. was a, there was a command line tool, like, and not WP CLI, but I have a feeling Dallin will not know the answer to this question, but I know Cody was using it when I worked with him on a project at Skyhook, and it was, it it did, you know, it synced command via command line changes from the database, and it was pretty amazing and pretty fast. And for the life of me, I cannot, I want to say it was WP Move, but it's not WP Move, so I don't know if what anybody's familiar think, with that. What makes you think I wouldn't I, know the answer to that? I, I, I don't <laughs> think you know the answer, Dallin. You might know. <laughs> I, I did not know the answer to that. You're still listening. <laughs> <laughs> I did not know the answer to that. You're correct. Yeah, I don't think it's WP CLI though. Yeah, maybe it's Move WP. I looked for WP Move. That's just tell me how to. Yeah, that's that's a bad search. <laughs> yeah, got to be careful. Yeah, I think everyone's everything's going to WP CLI now because that's that took over all the search results. WP CLI is actually a really awesome tool too. Um, I use it pretty extensively um, when I have just if I if I'm not using Migrate DB Pro or something like that. Sorry, WP Migrate. That's going to take a while to change my change my brain around. They better not change the name of ACF because if they change ACF, I'm screwed. I use I just call it ACF all the time. Um, what I like about Adobe CLI is I can import, I, I use Lando, so I can import a SQL file directly into my database and then I use migrate uh, WP CLI to change the URL, the, because you can uh, change the site URL, search all database entries for search, using their search and replace command. Um, uh, I think I can. I, yeah, it's really fast too. Yeah, so WP search replace, and then you tell it. What I really like about it is they have a dry run. So if it's like yep. a mission critical thing, I can say WP search replace, put my URL, my staging URL in, and a production URL in, and then hit dash dash dry run. And it will just tell me how many rows it's going to update. And then I can be like, I can spot check, okay, well, it's got you know 150 rows in mm -hmm. options. It tells you every table. Um, I wonder if I can actually, oh, I'm sharing the wrong window. Um, you could run it and it will basically say, these are all the tables that are gonna get modified. Give you an idea if you have a really, really bad search replace or not. Um, I use it for URLs, you can use it for anything. Um, uh, another tip that I didn't bring up for databases, uh, if you're concerned about emails getting sent out or if you're concerned about customer data um, being in the hands of a developer that you have, if you want to give them a copy of like a production database and there's email addresses stored for all your customers in there. Um, and, and another handy thing you can do is just write a SQL command to replace all email addresses with something completely different. So I've done things like where I replace dot, dot com with, uh, you know, I'll do like at domain.com. I'll search for like at and then uh, regex for domain name. So anything after the at symbol in an email address gets replaced with dummy.org. 
which means that no matter what your developer, obviously, hopefully we're working with other developers that we trust and we can give them this data in confidence that they won't exploit it. But in case you're in a situation where you have a production database and you're giving it to someone who you don't want to have any of that PII or, or personally identifiable, identifiable information, um, you just can, uh, it's, it's ideal to run a database command that will go through and replace all the email addresses with something that is that is not identifiable as, as people um, so that they can't email uh, the entire client list of someone you're working with. I didn't put that one in there because it's it's a, it's a messy command and it's a little extra, but uh, it's a, definitely a thing to keep in mind if you're concerned about um, you know, GDPR, things like that. One thing I haven't used, I'm curious if anyone has used, is uh, in local WP, um, WP Engine has added something they call Magic Sync, which lets you like do a delta change in database and files between your like local WP environment and one of their sites. I don't use WP Engine, mm -hmm. but um, if you're looking for like a really seamless workflow between local and production, that might be it's pretty nice GUI. You get WP CLI stuff built in. I know that they've done some pretty big performance boosts to it. I just, I haven't ever used that feature of it. So yeah, that's, that's one that I don't I either. And I think that's like the key. I think hosting companies building these things specifically for their hosting environments is like, is one thing as far as like DB deltas and changing because it's their own environment. Like they can manage that and handle it where it gets dicey is when you build that into like a deployment process that you're managing. Cause now it's like, you're on the hook for it. Yeah. Well, Lando ties in pretty well with Pantheon. Right. Yep. And then um, I think that Kingsta has some kind of local dev environment that they've yeah, I can't remember the name of it right Dev now. Dev Kingsta. They, is it Dev <laughs> Kingsta? I haven't, I haven't ever used it. I just know it's a thing. Yeah, there I think it is. It's, it's Docker based and it's Mac OS, Windows, and Linux. So I use Gridpane to run cloud uh, servers, and Gridpane has a, a built in staging function so that you can create staging push pulls from any of the servers you set up. I will say I, I've also used spin up WP to like do like different like deployment clones and get deployments and other things. It's phenomenal. Um, one little tiny gotcha um, that I, <laughs> I experienced when I first did a clone on spin up WP was that I had WordFence on that site. And when you put WordFence and it's like enhanced security protection mode, it puts a WordFence dash waf.php file in your directory and if that file is deleted or does not exist it like fatals the host site um, oh same yes. thing with same thing with grid pain you have to turn off the word fence before you do a clone yeah so or, that's, or, a, or a migration because the word fence will fight you yes actually that's, 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 a, that's a good point yeah. yeah that's like a big one with word fence so if you are ever migrating a word fence site you never want to take your firewall down but like that's something uh to know about you either have to have it in both environments or mm -hmm. yeah it's 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 a bit of a pain because they basically require that file and they check it in your ht access mm -hmm. um and if that file doesn't exist like everything yep. no bueno uh yeah uh, uh George pointed out Mailhog. I know that I think Land, or Lando has it and the uh, local OP has Mailhog, which is basically, it, it captures any email that would send from your local container server into this little web portal. So every email that your server would send goes in there. Um, the reason I don't typically suggest that is if you're working in, like I, I don't have every developer using Lando or every developer using local. So I can't rely that my developers are going to be working on the site in an environment that captures all the emails, which is why I do the disable emails. But yeah, that's a really good tool for working locally. Um, one off, like if it's you, only you working on it, and you know that Mailhog is consistent enough to not send emails, then it, it's probably pretty fine. Cause then you can test emails too. Matt, Matt Pro has a Mailhog built in too. Yeah. Yeah, I forgot they, they added that to you. It's a super useful tool, super awesome. I think there's even, um, I think Mailhog has a, a tool that was built by the Netflix team that will, uh, it will react inconsistently to make sure that you're catching uh, like mail not sending at all. Um, so I, I forget what it's called, uh, Mailhog. 
uh, plugins. I think there's one called like Monkey or something like that. Uh, actually, you know, I can probably even bring up my thing here. I probably have it running. They might have gotten rid of it, but it, it used to be there. Uh, Lando info. So where's my mail hog? There's my mail hog. So I can bring this up. Jim, that's what it was called. Jim the Chaos Monkey. Um, Jim the Chaos Monkey is uh, <laughs> it's inspired by Netflix. And basically it can do, uh, re it can reject emails. It can um, limit connection uh, frequencies. It can reject authentication sender, send, uh, senders and recipients so that you're, when you're writing code, obviously for WordPress, we're using an abstraction with WP Mail and our plugins. But if there's some sort of rejection to an SMTP server, Jim can actually act that way and, and then kind of like give you inconsistent results so that you can code uh, the not just the happy path, but the sad path uh, into your email applications, which I thought was pretty cool. But yeah, this is Mailhog. I don't have any mail coming in right now. I wonder if I can send one really quick. Uh, where's my browser? So let's see, I can go here. I can go to, oh, here you go. A little preview of EDD3 for anyone who's EDD customer. Uh, and, uh, let's see here. So I can just like hit resend receipt, sure. Hopefully this works. This is new. Oh yeah, there we go, mail. So now I've got the purchase receipt that came through. Um, so that's my server sending an email to a random email address and, and an improper email address, um, but Mailhog caught it. So it's really cool because you can have, even put in invalid email addresses and Mailhog captures it because it never goes out to an actual SMTP server. It's pretty cool. Awesome. Yeah, I use I use Map Pro, and which is why I don't use local because local, I only have one client with a with WP Engine, but whenever I try to run local, it fights with Map Pro for the ports. <laughs> yeah, and, and and local doesn't always clear itself when it when it leaves, yeah. or when when you shut it down, and so Map Pro will come up and it's like, oh, somebody else is using those ports, and it's it's not easy to get it cleared, so. Mm -hmm. I think local works a lot like Lando, where uh, so Lando, I can have as many sites as I want all running, running in Docker containers. And I believe local does this too, where it it kicks up a single container or something like a container. It's not a container anymore, but they they what yeah. they do is they have a router. They define a router that listens to all the requests to yes. local and figures out what um, what instance to send it to. Uh, same concept. Um, they're not they're not containers anymore though. Yes, uh, they're fully native. Now, one thing you can do with local, if you need to run, I don't know about with MAMP because I haven't used MAMP in a number of years now, but you can turn local into router only mode. Um, so it doesn't try to do that resolution. Uh, so it doesn't hog uh, port 80. It doesn't like hog some of the more standard ports and it will just be like localhost colon 101.53 or something like that. And when I have had to run uh, Docker and uh, local in the same uh, in the same situation, it's often one of the better ways um, to work with it. You just don't get the nice like you can have like one of the things I really like doing in local is having like you know Dave dot WP and I use dot WP as my like development prefix, which is just really handy. Um, but you can't do that when you're in router mode, so. I just posted a link to the router only mode in, in the chat. Yeah. Now it is still like taking up ports though. So like if you do, yeah. if MAMP is on one of those ports, you're kind of like out of luck, uh, but. That's for a whole different talk. We're not getting a networking stack at this point because I don't want to deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that wasn't going to go down that rat hole. Oh, good old networking stack. <laughs> Well, cool. My uh, general, I was just going to say, my general rule of thumb for what you broke down as soft versus hard changes is soft changes I always pull down, you know, production down to server, down to local or whatever, and hard changes always go up. So you always know you're testing code. Um, 
So I just always try to keep that in mind. Like, is what I'm working on right now something I need to ultimately pull down or ultimately need to push up? And that just kind of helps me think it through. Because, yeah, you always got to have that untouchable database on production, unfortunately. Yeah. And I think it's, it's if we can, look, I mean, one of the, one of the best things about developers is that we can solve our own problems. And I think sometimes we let that get in our way. Uh, that we can, oh, no, 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 I can figure that out. I can figure it out. I can figure it Like there is a, a, a beauty to making it simple. Like you said, my rule is I pull down soft changes. I push up hard changes. If I need to put a soft change into production after working locally, I will spend way more time and make things so, so much more challenging if I try and automate that soft change. Whereas if I just write it down and, and go through, uh, your time is valuable. As a developer, I mean, whether working for clients or working for a company, your time is super valuable. If you can save yourself five minutes of just writing down a database change, whether it's a setting you have to change when you get to production, as opposed to trying to write it into code and test it, and make sure it works, and then continue to support that change going on in the future and maintain the code, uh, it's far easier just to, like you said, uh, my hard changes go up and I just, I make the soft changes myself. Um, yeah, even, even the way migrate db will let you just sync specific databases you know i'm yeah i've used it a few times but i'm terrified when I do it. <laughs> yeah but along those lines i also like if i can pay for something that is quality and tested from someone i trust like how much is my time worth how much would mm -hmm. i pay myself and just because i could go spend two or four hours like getting it to work if i can like spend 15 minutes doing it I throw money at problems when I can. And it's not mm -hmm. always even like company money. Like sometimes if there's something where it's like, no, this software is going to make my life a lot nicer. I, I'll throw personal money at it because it's just like, I'd much rather spend that time learning something else or doing something else. Yeah, that's a huge, I mean, it's, it's obviously a luxury or a privilege to be able to, to have that mentality. But like as, as, we, as we as developers sit here and work through really hard challenges. I mean, we're, we're starting to get into a realm in the WordPress space where it's a challenge to be a solid WordPress developer with all the things that in the marketing speak that's going out to clients and going out to customers of the cool new fancies. We're stuck here in the back trying to figure out how that actually works and make it work. Um, sometimes, you know, if you, if you have to build it into a client pitch and be like, yep, we're going to do this and I know how we're going to do it, uh, but I'm going to need to buy a tool and that tool is, you know, $200. Well, they will be like, I don't know, a $200 tool will be like, okay, I can build it for you, but that's going to take about four to six hours of my time. And let me tell you, that's going to be cheaper if I just pay for it. And I know the developers, I know they have good support. If there's something wrong, I know who to go to. Um, there is, there is something very, very important that we, we don't always have to scratch our own itch. We don't always have to do it ourselves we aren't like domain experts on everything. A lot of us are, are gen, I wouldn't say generalists, but a lot of us are skilled and talented at multiple areas, but not many of us are super, super amazing with databases or super, super amazing with SAS or less or compilers. So instead of trying to fight it and, and become an expert at all these areas, sometimes it's better to know when your domain knowledge is at its max and say, for less than three hours of my time, someone else has solved this for me. Um, I think that is a, a critical thing for a developer to figure out <laughs> when, that, when that line is able to cross. I love talking this stuff. This stuff's fun to me. Deployments are, are, are amazing. I think uh, it's, it's where all the code and hard work that we do like finally goes out to the masses and, and the users. So it's it's like one of my favorite things to do is push code live. Feels good too. Cause then you get to have scotch, right? Is it scotches for shippers? So you are super knowledgeable about databases. It's it, the, the level of awareness and attention it requires is stressful. <laughs> you know? So yeah. Tools and automation are best for that. And I feel like, you know, if we make a code change, we can just hit control Z and all of a sudden we're good. Or we can have a backup like with databases, there's no control Z. 
like you're committing transactions and going back on that, you have to know what the value was before, or you need to know how to do like, like there, there is a way to do it in database to roll back uh, transactions. But like most hosting companies you're going to work with, don't give you that level of access. Right. Um, so. So the one thing I will throw out there, and I know we all have feelings about this product and this company um, is that automatic has a backup solution that does real time backups every single change is a like is a change set point so um truly you can roll back you know minute by minute hour by hour everything any order any anything so um you know for the, for some clients it might be the right fit um and they do offer it as an isolated thing you don't have to bring all of jetpack uh, to the table, but obviously not all of us want all of our data going over to WordPress.com. So, because that's the key, it, it syncs it via their SaaS, right? Correct. Yeah. So that that is, you'd have to know that, and that when you're doing that, you're sending all those change sets over to automatic servers. Um, yeah. For some clients, it's not a big deal. For some people, it's not a big deal. For some people, it is a big deal, depending on. Um, if they're, uh, I think a, a, the GDPR realm has made that something that people are hyper aware of. I don't yeah. love GDPR. I don't think it's worked, but it has made people hyper aware of the, where their data exists, which means you would have to put in your terms of service and your privacy policy that, you know, these are your processors and one of them is automatic. So someone may see that if they are actually reading privacy policies and be like, well, I, I'm not going to do anything here because my data would then be automatic servers. Um, so that's, that's a, but that could go, that's not just automatic. It's just X company, sure. um, MailChimp or Drip or whatever. So, but yeah, of any of the hosts and companies out there doing backups, it is, I must like from a user experience standpoint, it's, it's pretty impressive. So yeah. for the right client, I understand awesome motive may not, uh, may not be there. So. No, we, we, we use a, a couple of different ones. Actually, 